Amen, amen, amen. <clears throat> at some level, you've heard the gospel at least four times, uh, five times counting the prayer, once in the video, three times in song. Um, so we've heard lots of good news already uh, and celebrated. I pray you've, you've, you've worshipped uh, and enjoyed the gospel and the good news of Christ through song, through prayer, and through, uh, through that video. Um, yeah, that song is unbelievable. Um, so let me try to recover. Uh, Philippians, we'll be in Philippians chapter 3 today. So usually we kind of walk through books of the Bible um, for this service, um, just kind of where we're at in Matthew. We want to, want to do something a little out of the ordinary. We'll go to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 1 through 11, and then we'll pray and get started. Um, just so you know, if you're a visitor and you don't have a Bible, uh, we've got some, I think, at the back table, and then some up there. Uh, we'd love for you to have one as a gift uh, from us to you. Uh, please take one of those if you don't have a Bible uh, on your way out. Philippians 3, verses 1 through 11. Let's read it together. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes this. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And this is God's word. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would be here as you already are because your word has promised it. So we're just claiming the truth that where your people are, our individuals dwelt by the Spirit, and therefore where we gather, we all gather together in the Spirit. And so Spirit, we pray you would do what you do, guide us into the truths of Scripture, open our hearts and eyes and our minds that we might see the Lord Jesus, might see Him exalted for who He is, that our hearts might respond by being overwhelmed with His beauty, turn from sin, rest in Christ and worship and give you the glory and honor that you do, Father, Son, and Spirit. I pray, get me out of the way and you do what you do. I'm but a mere man and, and sinful as anybody in here. I have nothing good to say apart from you, but through your word and by the power of the Spirit, the very words of life to say. So Spirit, give new life even now. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As my good friend, um, pastor, kind of mentor friend, Tony Marita says, um, as we come together on Easter, uh, we're celebrating because the tomb is empty and the throne is occupied. So we have, we have good news to gather together, uh, that again, our world is being ran and held together by a great king. Good Friday, we celebrate the fact that the Lord Jesus suffered under the full wrath of God that we should have for our sins. And it's Good Friday because he died as a substitute for those that could be saved and reconciled to God. Though, as my daughter said, as we're reading it by the bedside, she's like, why do we call it good when it's so sad? Because think about it, as Christians, we're a little bit weird if we're just honest. We call Good Friday the Friday when the Messiah, the King, was bloody and beaten and crucified, thorns on his head. It would appear to be he lost. Satan on Good Friday celebrates because he thinks he won. But the problem is, for Satan at least, that death couldn't hold him. Sin could not keep him in the grave, nor could death. Three days later, he was raised to new life. He walked out of that tomb in the Middle East. And if they ever find that tomb, they will find it empty. It's there and it's empty. We, we worship a resurrected king. The Son of God lived the life required to earn heaven, yet died the death that sinners like you and I deserve. In our place, rose from the grave so that we could look to him in repentance and faith, 
receive his righteous record given to us, our sinful record given to him, and through faith in Christ be reconciled to God. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what we celebrate on Easter weekend. So if you're, if you're a visitor, again, this Easter morning, I want to welcome you. I do want to give you the, the warning that this might not be quite what you're accustomed to for an Easter service. So usually on the Easter service, maybe you would show up. And I was talking with a friend last night at the wedding, and she said to me, are you ready for your sermon yet? And I was like, nah, not yet. That doesn't usually get complete to about 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, right before Sunday school. And, um, and she said, well, it's pretty easy. Go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You'll find it, and you can take care of it. And I think that's what normally people would expect. You're going to show up, and there's going to be a narrative from one of, the, one of the Gospels about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But that's not what we're going to, we're going to do this morning. And here's why. You could say at some level, at Freedom Church, we celebrate Easter every Sunday. So we preach the cross, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ every single... By God's grace, there will never be a Sunday anybody's in this pulpit where that's not preached. So we're going we're gonna to celebrate Easter Sunday as Christians every single Sunday. Because if we have not the gospel, we have nothing. We're just a bunch of sinners who've dressed up. We're a bunch of dressed up sinners gathering together, acting like we're somebody. If we don't have the gospel. So we're going to preach the gospel every single week. And so this Sunday, at some level, we, we, we're going to say the same things we always say. We're kind of like that, you know, the one hit wonder kind of band. Like we only got one good song and we just sing it every week. <laughs> the same chorus, the same hook, the, the same song over and over and over. The good news is that's kind of all we got as Christians. We're not necessarily the most brilliant. We're not necessarily the most impressive. We're just sinners who've come to a really brilliant and impressive and gracious God. And so we can only tell about that message. Every week, this is what we do. So what I want to do this morning is talk about the great reward of the resurrection. So what is it that Christ accomplished in his resurrection that makes us so amped up that we would talk about resurrection every Sunday, not just one Sunday a year? What is the great gain that we get out of the reward? What, what did Easter accomplish for God's people? What is the result of the empty tomb for the Christian? So what is it when the Christian celebrates the empty tomb? What's that great reward that because the tomb was empty happens and means for us? Today we're going to look at Philippians 3, 1 to 11 and find the answer to, that, to this question. The great reward of the gospel is being enabled to know Christ. Like Jesus is the reward of the gospel for the Christian. The empty tomb means I get to know God. I would not get to know him in any other way other than his just wrath against me. But because the tomb is empty, because Christ died for my sins, because he rose from the grave, I can now come to him in repentance and faith, and I can actually know God. So Luke Martin Luther's great question, how can a sinful man be right with a holy God? Well, because Christ died in our place and rose from the grave and the tomb is empty. This is the great reward of the gospel. We get to know Christ. As we see in Philippians, this was Paul's great aim in life, to know Christ. What is your great aim in life? What drives you in life? What are you after? When you, you lay awake at night in the bed, what is it that your mind most naturally drifts towards? What is it that you're after that informs every single decision that you make because you're after it? What are you striving for? What are you yearning for? What are you longing for? What is your great aim in life? What is of surpassing value to you? What is it for you that if you could not ever have would make it your life not worth living? What is it that drives the desire behind every single action? What is your great aim in life? For Paul, the answer to these questions is simple. Knowing Jesus. For Paul, that's it. I just want to know Christ. That's my all-surpassing value. That's my aim in life. That's the desire behind every desire I have is to know Christ. Easter makes the Christian's greatest longing possible. The empty tomb means you get to get your greatest longing, and your greatest longing is Christ, whether you know it or not. You were created to be in a relationship with Him. You're created to grow in Him. So you can run to all the other things you want to. It'll never satisfy. It'll always leave you lonely. It'll always leave you down because you're made to crave and find life in Christ. Easter makes our greatest longing possible. That's why Paul begins in chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Let me give you a little context. Paul's writing this letter from prison. So he's literally locked up because he's a Christian and because he's telling other people this good news. 
hey, guess what? The only thing you need to be able to be saved is to be jacked up. <laughs> like, are you jacked up? Great, you qualify. Christ dies for jacked up people. That's who he came for. He said, I came for the sinners. Like the Pharisees think they're good. They don't need anything. The sinners understand I have no hope. Christ shows up and says, that's, that's the one I can work with. So Paul's going around telling this good news. Like basically all you need is need and you can be saved. All you need to do is admit you're jacked up and you can be saved. God loves you enough to save you. And he gets locked up. And so he begins this letter in Philippians. It says, brother, like you just starts off, guys, in chapter three, rejoice. There's good news all throughout this letter. This, this, I was reading through Philippians, just getting ready. Literally reading through Philippians, it just drips with affection that Paul has for the Christians in Philippi. I mean, every other word, he's just happy, he's thankful, he's overwhelmed, he's joyful. You just see these themes, he's overwhelmed. That, that he's excited about the advancement of the gospel. He's excited about this little church in Philippi that he planted probably about 10 years before writing this. He's later, he's probably been walking with God for about 30 years. And he is literally locked up and he's happy. And so he says, it's no trouble for me to write this to you. Like, Paul, I... I Prison, I think I would call that trouble. I, mean, I just don't know. Like, if I'm in prison, it seemed to be I'm in. I'm, but he says, it's no, it's no trouble to me. I'm excited to pin these things to you, this good news, this gospel. I'm excited to remind you. And not only that, this is safe for you. Do you notice that? It's no trouble to me, and it's safe for you for me to remind you of the good news of the gospel. Paul knows we drift. Paul knows we have a tendency to forget the gospel and drift away from the gospel. And so he says, rejoice, brothers. It's no trouble to me. And this is safe for you, for me to write these things to you, even from prison. In chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, he says this, as he's talking about it. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me in prison has really served to advance the gospel. So this become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul says, they lock me up to shut me up, and all they've done is pour fire on the gasoline of the gospel, and it's just spreading everywhere. And so he's excited, even though he's in prison. He, he sees what we see throughout church history. Often persecution against Christians, again, is like pouring gasoline on the fire of the gospel. You can lock us up. You can't stop the gospel. So what we saw in Matthew a few weeks ago. Christ said, I'll build my church. Gates of Hades will not prevail. Hell can't stop it. Gospel will advance. So Paul says it's safe for you. And then verses 2 through 11, he's going to get into the great aim of knowing Jesus. So he says, this, what I'm doing for you right now is helping you know Jesus. And, and then 2 through 11, he's going to get into this great aim. I just want to know him more. But we'll break it up into two parts. First, we're going to see a contrast between opponents of the gospel and true Christians. So what does a kind of a, a false gospel, a false Christian look like? What does a true Christian look like? And that'll be um, the first part. And then the second part, we'll see Paul just... Um, display this passion uh, for knowing Christ. So I've framed the two points with, with two questions to help you search your own heart and apply this text. So question number one, who is your confidence in? Who is your confidence in? <clears throat> so the first thing you need to know as we jump into this, you cannot know Christ if you're putting your confidence in the wrong place. Like you cannot know him. You cannot be a Christian if you place your confidence in the wrong place. Look at verse two. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. So Paul's warning these Christians in Philippi to watch out for the Judaizers. So we learn from Acts chapter 15 that there was these false teachers, these Jewish folks in the church who were kind of telling these Gentile, the pagan converts that have just come into the church. Hey, you guys, yeah, you, you get saved by Jesus, but you also have to do all the Jewish laws. So you've got to convert to Christianity, but you also have to convert to Judaism. So you've got to follow the rules and the traditions and the rituals of Moses in the ways that we interpret and tell you you have to follow those rules. So what they're telling is you've got to follow Jesus plus these rules. And so th these, these folks have come in to the church. And Acts 15.1 says, Some men came down from Judea, were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So circumcision was the main tradition they're, they're forcing on these Christians. So they're gathering these young Christians in Philippi who are insecure. They're young in the faith. They're afraid. Now there's mean, intimidating men who know the scriptures better than they do saying, hey, if you're not also circumcised, you're not really saved. And so Paul responds. And what does he say? Ironically, what does he call them? Dogs. He says, watch out for the dogs. OK, time out. Let me do some contextual translation right here. All right. You think dog, you think cute little cuddly puppy pet at the house, right? 
In Jewish context, that's not what they would be thinking. Dogs would have been wild animals that are mangy, are dirty, are dangerous, that are going around, and you need to avoid them, be, be careful. So think coyote. Does that help the, the, the illustration there? So here's, what, here's what's interesting. Paul says, watch out for the dogs. Now, just a few weeks ago when we were in Matthew, what did we find out that Jews, the, the slang term they would use to downplay Gentiles, what did we call them? Dogs. Remember the woman said even the dogs get to eat the crumbs? The lady said, I don't care. Call me a dog. I just want some crumbs from you, Jesus. So literally, Paul now says, ironically, though they call Gentiles dogs, because they're adding to this gospel, they're the dogs. And so he uses this this offensive term to display. When you add good works, you add rules, you add something to Jesus alone, you are a dog. You are dangerous. You are coming, trying to tear up and devour the gospel. And so beware of these dogs. Beware of any teachers that would teach Jesus plus anything to be saved. This is what his warning is. This is always a threat to the gospel, namely legalism. Like our sinful hearts are always tempted to think I got to do something to appease God for the wrong things I've done. I need to make up by doing good things more than the bad things that I've done. And maybe he'll kind of grade on a curve and see that I'm okay. This is essentially the foundation of every other world religion. You're supposed to have some religious experience. And then you need to do more good than bad after that religious experience. And then you get before God on judgment day and hope for the best. Essentially, like works is this. I've got to do more good than bad. And hopefully when I get to God, he'll say I did enough good to get to him. Paul says this is false teaching from dogs. In the Bible Belt, what does this look like? It looks like Jesus plus moralism. So it looks like you need, to, you need to pray a prayer, you need to believe in Jesus, and you need to be a good little boy or girl and start acting like a good Christian. Well, here's the problem with you saying that, or me saying that. The Scripture says no one is good but God alone. The good Christian's an oxymoron. doesn't exist. There's only one good, God. That's it. Now, there's faithful Christians, right? We want, we want, to, we want to imitate and follow and learn from faithful Christians, so that's fine. But to say good Christian at some level says, well, Jesus died for them and they're a pretty good person. Jesus plus they're... So friend, in the Bible Belt, we have to do work to make sure, what what are we putting our confidence in? Am I trusting in Jesus plus something? Am I trusting Jesus' work plus my work? Do I think Jesus needs a little help? Like he made salvation possible for me, but I got to do my part to make sure I get in. Paul says that's the false teaching of dogs. No, good Christians. Christians are Christian because they trust in the goodness of another, namely Christ. Christians are those who realize I got no goodness in and of myself. I need Christ to give me his goodness. And then again, we can be faithful Christians. And amen, we want to honor and applaud those who model walking with Christ for us well. But let's let's be careful that we don't add moralism towards or to Christianity. So Paul goes on and he describes four marks of a true Christian. Look at verse 3. He's going to give us four marks. If you want to know, like, these are the false Christians. They say Jesus plus. Here's four marks of a, of a true Christian. One, he says, for we are the circumcision. What does he mean by that? <clears throat> Again, ironically, he's saying the thing they're saying you have to do to be saved, to get circumcised. He's like, Christians are already the circumcision, meaning we are the people of God. So he would write in, in Romans chapter 2, verse 29, A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is the matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but God. So Paul says, your problem with circumcision, their false teachers are saying it's physical, it's external. But God says the circumcision that matters is the circumcision of the heart that you can't see, but God can. What you need is a new heart, Paul says. We are the circumcision. Like Christians are those who said, my heart's jacked up and Christ has given me a new one. And so Paul says, we are the circumcision. So they're telling you to do something external. I'm telling you Christ does it internally. They can't touch that. So first, we are the circumcision. He says in Galatians 6.15, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. We need new hearts. Friend, have you been made new? Like, was there a point in your life when your heart was going one direction and Christ made it new and sent it the other direction? Are you a new creation? As Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. The old is gone, the new has come. Have you been made new? If you have never been made new, there's no reason for you to be confident you are in Christ. Because Christ makes people new. 
Paul says we are the circumcision. Secondly, Christians, he says we worship by the Spirit of God. Christians have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And what, what, what does this look like? What is this kind of mark of a Christian? Again, we're the people who've got new hearts. And with those new hearts, now we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. What does that look like? That means when we sin, the, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. And I was having a conversation with a brother came by the other day. And he talked to me. He's like, man, I, I went and did some stuff I shouldn't have done. And as soon as I was in it, man, I just went home and I wept. I was in my scriptures. I was praying. I was in my word. And that's what the Spirit does. Like, before you were converted, you loved to sin. And you hated anything to do with God. At least you were apathetic to it. That's the same thing as hatred towards God. But you get converted. And now you suddenly go sin and you're expecting to enjoy it like you used to. And it's like, oh, I don't, I don't quite feel comfortable doing this anymore. I'm uncomfortable. What is this? Because the Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, convicts us of Christ's righteousness. The Spirit convicts us of truth. It guides us into the Word. So suddenly we find, like, the Word is coming alive to me now. It used to be just black words on a white page. And now suddenly it's the words of life penetrating my heart and changing me. And this is because the Spirit of God lives in the Christian. Jesus, we're those who Jesus spoke of in John 4, 23. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Friend, again, I ask you, are you convicted of sin? Are you growing in your love for his word and beginning slowly as it may be to understanding more? It's because the spirit dwells in you if you're in Christ. Thirdly, he says we are those who glory in Christ. For Christians, we have one thing to boast. Jesus Christ. You ask us what we're proud of? Jesus. Well, what you got to show for yourself? Jesus. Who you think you are? I'm, I'm with him. I'm with Jesus. And he's all I got. He's literally, he's all I have. Luke, Luke messes with me because of my bad English. He's all I got. He's all I have. Like Jesus is my only boast. So Paul says, we just glory in him. You bump into us and we're just going to brag on Jesus. So if you don't want to hear somebody bragging on Jesus, don't get around Christians. This is what Paul says. This is an authentic Christian. We got new hearts, the spirit dwelling in us, and the spirit dwelling in us always makes us brag on Jesus. Study John 15 to 17. That's what the Spirit does. Guides you in the truth and exalts Jesus. That's just what He does inside of your life. So again, we are those who glory in Christ. Paul says in Galatians 6, 14, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world's been crucified to me and I to the world. And then fourthly, he says, We are those who put no confidence in the flesh. Christians are those who literally, our hope is not found in anything we can do or have done. So we don't trust our rituals, we don't trust our race, we don't trust our culture, we don't trust our natural thoughts, we don't trust anything in and of ourselves. We do not put our trust in our flesh. Because we know our flesh is naturally jacked up. And so we are, the first thing is, you know, again, we live in a culture that says follow your heart. That's ignorant if you know the Bible. The scripture says you have a wicked heart. So to follow your heart is to follow wickedness. You need a new heart. And in that new heart, you start walking with Christ. Now you've got this internal battle going on between the new heart and the old, and you're fighting. And so even there, be careful. Maybe you should follow your heart, but maybe not. Like learn With the scriptures, learn how to do that in community. But again, we, we put no confidence in ourselves. And so Paul illustrates this to the max in verses 4 through 6. And so Paul does a little something like, okay, let me, let me play your game with you for a minute. These false teachers, these dogs, the Jesus plus people, let me play the game with you for a minute. Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. So I don't put confidence in the flesh, but if I want it to, let me, let, me, let me unveil the resume. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. What's that mean? He said, I was born into the people of God. Eighth day, I got circumcised. I was a Jew, naturally a Jew. I didn't convert. That I, I didn't get converted to Judaism. I was born into the right way, into the right family. I got the sign on the eighth day. Do not some people seem to think in their Christianity... Like because of where I was born. Therefore, I have something that, that is impressive to God. Maybe you were baptized as an infant. So you think suddenly you're saved because you were baptized as an infant. Circumcised on a day. Then he says, of the people of Israel. What does he mean? The people of God. I, I was, so not only was I born into the right kind of family lineage, and I didn't convert to it, but I was actually born into it. I was of the, like I'm from Israel. I'm the people of God. God's chosen special people. I'm in it. And in the Bible Belt, do people not consistently think, well, just because I go to church Wednesday and, and Sundays and whatever, I'm, I'm a Christian. 
I love what one person says, um, you know, being in the church building doesn't make you any more Christian than being in a garage makes you a car. You can be in the building all you want. doesn't mean you're Christian. And so Paul's saying, again, I can, I can play this game with you. Circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So this was a tribe of Israel that was faithful when others weren't. So Paul says, not only was I in, circumcised the eighth day, I was of the people of God. I was in that tribe that was known for being faithful. Y'all mess with that one. So I was in the good ones. So not only was I in in general, like even as you get inside the inner circle, in the inner circle, I was impressive. I was with the right people. <clears throat> Again, think about people in churches that grew up particularly in the Bible. Do people not think, well, I'm, I'm special to God because my dad was a deacon and his dad was a deacon and his dad was a deacon. So not only was I born in the church, not only have I prayed a prayer and been baptized, but man, my family's been deacons for forever. Paul says, I can, I can play that game with you. A Hebrew of Hebrews. So he's not only a Jew, but he re- retained Aramaic. He could speak Hebrew. So as the culture changed and shifted, he, he kept his Hebrew sharp. So he's, again, he said, anything you want to do on the resume, I got you. So not only was he churched, but he read the King James only and could pray in King James. <laughs> Understood what he was saying. So again, he said, Any, anything you want to boast in, I got you. Let's keep going. As to the law of Pharisee. So he's, he's devout in his law keeping. He's an expert on law. And he says, I was, I was a Pharisee. I was the most extreme of the people who obeyed the law. I knew it inside and out. And so again, you guys know I like to quote the thing I used to always think was super corny. And I still do, but it's funny. Um, so you go over in the Bible Belt. Don't cuss, don't tr- drink, don't chew, and don't go with women who do. Paul says, I got you. I followed all those silly rules that the church makes up that's not in the Bible. Paul says, I did all that too. As to zeal, verse 6, a persecutor of the church. Paul dragged Christians off, had them murdered. Do we not live in a culture, as again, as Tony Marita highlighted, do we not live in a culture where people think their sincerity makes something right? But you don't know how sincere I am. My well, friend, you might be sincerely wrong. That's the problem. You can be sincere as you want, but you might be wrong. And you're not the judge of right or wrong. God is. And so Paul says, nobody had zeal like me. Nobody was more serious and sincere than me. I was having Christians killed. That's how sincere I was. And then lastly, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he says, for outward obedience to the Ten Commandments. I did it. I didn't break any of them outwardly. So you can look at my life and say, hey, Paul, which one of the Ten Commandments you broke? He said, none of them. Blameless. Guiltless. So again, he, he pulls up his resume and he puts the Judaizers in their place. He was a beast in all the categories that they would put their confidence in. So he was all pro. He was conference player of the year. Uh, play, like he was at all of it. MVP, Paul was it. So he says, you guys want to compete with one another. Here, look at this. So on their playing field, he showed that he should have been the most confident in his pedigree. And it's Paul's resume not put us all to shame. You know, Christians uh, get to feel good about themselves when they compare themselves to less mature Christians or to non-Christians. So Christians feel like, I'm a good Christian. Well, that's because of who you're looking at to define what good is. Compare yourself to Paul. How are you feeling now? Feel like a good Christian anymore? Or do you feel as low as I do? <laughs> Again, so, so we look at Paul and we, and we realize his resume is unbelievable. But here's what's interesting. That's not Paul's point. Paul takes it a step further. He's not saying compare yourself to me. What is he saying? Compare yourself to Christ. He's the standard. So then even Paul, after reading off this unbelievable resume, verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He said that unbelievable resume that could actually trump yours, I counted all as loss. I don't even think it's impressive anymore. What I used to be proud of, I've now repented of. You see that? He used to be proud of this. Look how good I am. He's like, in Christ, I'm ashamed of how proud I was about that resume. So the very thing I used to pride myself in, I've repented for my pride over. Everything I had, every gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul says, I I took my resume and I compared it to Christ's resume. And Christ's resume was infinitely greater. So I ripped mine up because it was a joke. Better yet, I nailed it to the cross. Christ was crucified for my arrogance over my resume, is what Paul says. 
And then Christ freely gave me his resume. What he once counted gain, he now counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Friends, what's your confidence in today? Your last name? Family you grew up in? The fact you go to church? Your own morality? The list of things you've never done wrong? What, what's your confidence in? What are, you, what are you basing yourself in? The fact you hadn't broken any of the Ten Commandments outwardly? Jesus destroyed that in Matthew 5-7 through in the Sermon on the Mount and showed us all of us have broken them all inwardly. What are you, what's your confidence in? Your thoughts of what's right and wrong? Your sincerity because you're really sincere? What, do you, what, are you, what are you placing your confidence in? The only safe place to invest your confidence is in the Christ who would live, die, and raise for you in your place. There are innumerable ways to be a non-Christian. There's a ton of different ways to be a non-Christian. You can reject Jesus altogether or you can say, I'll take Jesus and I'll add X, Y, and Z. And then the other person says, I'll take Jesus and I'll add A, B, and C. You can add whatever you want to him. But Paul says, if you add anything to him, by definition, you are not a Christian. What is your confidence in? The Christian is trusting in Jesus plus nothing. Our confidence is Christ and Christ alone. He's our only boast. We rest in him. He's our confidence. He's our boast. Everything else we used to place our confidence in, we now count as loss. We repent of trusting in what we used to be proud of. Secondly, what is your life's great ambition? Once you've gotten to this point, once you've seen Christ as your only hope, once you've seen the bad news of your sin and the good news of his death, burial, and resurrection in your place, once you've seen his love for you, you've seen his, the beauty of his grace, his resurrection, once you get there, once you get to the place where you say, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss, Paul said there's now one all-consuming passion, namely to know Jesus. This is his great ambition. Christian, is it yours? If you call yourself a follower of Christ, is your great ambition to know Christ? Is that what drives you? Do you lay up at night thinking about how might I know him more? How might I know who he is? Not, not my great aim being to get his blessing. Like, how can I do enough good stuff so Jesus will rig circumstances to go my way? No. Do you want actually to know him? Is that your prize? Is that the good news of an empty tomb? Is that you get to know Christ? Not to get his blessings. Not just to get the feeling of guilt removed. That can be an utterly selfish motive. I just don't want to feel guilty anymore, so I'll pray a prayer. You see how you're just using Jesus? No, he's the goal. I just want him is what Paul says. Not, I don't want him just to get to go to a place where there's gold streets and I get to be with lost loved ones who repented and believed in him. Though that's a good thing to want. It's just not the ultimate thing. Again, what is it that drives you? What is your ambition? Is it to know him? Not just to be a Christian leader or a preacher or an elder. Not, that can't be the end. The end has to be I want to know Christ more. I just want more of him. That's Paul's great ambition. So how can we know him? How can we get this ambition if we don't already have it? Paul continues, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything. So not just his resume. So he said, I count it all loss. Again, not just my impressive resume I used to try to show off with. I count that, but I count everything as loss because, and listen to why he grounds it. Why does he do that? Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul is motivated by simple logic. Christ is better than anything else. That's pretty simple, right? So he's just better. There's surpassing worth in him. Nothing compares to him. So Paul says everything else is lost because nothing is that good. Knowing Christ is better than anything else on the planet. It's better than your dream career. It's better than your dream marriage. It's better than your dream family. It's better than your dream house. It's better than your dream car. It's better than your dream reputation of fame. It's better than whatever it is you're after. Christ is just better, period. Paul says, it's just surpassing worth in him. He's just better. And so it's my aim to know him because he's better. He's infinitely more valuable than all of your dreams put together. Think about that for a minute. Christ is infinitely more valuable to you than all of your dreams put together. Infinitely. Times infinite, whatever. Whatever we call it. You got it, right? (laughs) He's better. This is Paul's logic. It's what drives him. He sounds like the psalmist in Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. Now surely the psalmist would like, you know, a good steak. I mean, maybe not. I don't know about the rule. Anyway, point being, like he liked a good meal. 
Surely he desired other things. So what is he? Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire beside you. Like nothing compares to you. You surpass the worth of everything else. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's fullness of joy at your right hand pleasures forevermore. Psalm 8410, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Paul just sounds like the psalmist. (laughs) Jesus, you're just better than anything else. So I make it my aim and my passion to know you. Paul continues and shows us once you've seen his beauty of Christ and his gospel, everything else is put in its proper place. And he goes on and says, you know, again, this, this, this phrase um, that he says is a little bit awkward. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Rubbish literally is dung. I don't, I, I literally, I was trying to think about how can I make this not crass, but Paul wants to be crass. So there's, there's no way I can get around it. So literally, he, he's saying, like, Christ is so much better than everything else. Everything else in comparison to him is like a cow patty. But that's what he's saying. It's garbage. It's dung. Like, it's just not even in the same category. This morning, I was looking out the window, and the sun was uh, sun rising behind me. I was working uh, on the sermon, and the sun was coming up. I looked out the window. Sunrise was, I mean, it's just brilliant. It's beautiful. <clears throat> so I want you to imagine if I'm looking out this window at this sunrise, and it's just in all of its glory, all kind of shades of pink and orange and blue and the cloud, and the whole thing is just beautiful. I want you to imagine if I'm looking out that window and this is what I'm thinking. Man, my bed head in the reflection of that mirror looks re- or window looks really, really good. My hair's all crazy, you know, because I'm, I'm up early. And I look at the reflection in the window of myself and I start talking about how beautiful that is. One, it's vain. Two, it's not true. Three, <laughs> three, it's ridiculous. Why? Because there's something that surpasses the beauty by far. It's not even close to comparable. And so I'm gazing at the image of God rather than worshiping God himself. That's what Paul said. Like Christ in his beauty eclipses any sunrise. Like literally the sun rise. Like S-U-N versus S-O-N rise. Like the Easter, what we celebrate. There's nothing more beautiful than the sunrise. So for you to, to, to value and to treasure something else is as silly as me looking at a reflection of myself in the window and ignoring the sunrise. So Paul says it's just surpassing worth when we see his beauty. So he says, for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all these things. Now, no, this is not warm and fuzzy. What does he say? I suffered the loss of all these things and count them as rubbish. So it's not like this was just warm and fuzzy cake. Like, oh, it's a beautiful sunrise. That's it. I'm going to kick my feet up. Illustration, every illustration breaks down at some point, right? It's like, no, he said, I suffered. Paul lost everything. Reputation. I mean, he had the equivalent of like two PhDs, essentially in our culture. By like 30. He lost it all. Lost his friends, probably lost his family. He lost his reputation. He lost his job stat. Paul lost everything. When he's saying this, he's in prison, saying his, his beauty surpasses all. So again, this is not warm fuzzy. He counts it all as loss, though, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. He's saying that all that he once cherished now is like a nasty cow patty. This is what Paul is saying. <clears throat> now, what he does as he kind of covers the, the theological gauntlet as we wrap this up and shows us, now, how do we know Christ then? So if, this, if we want this, how do, we, how do we get it? How do we know him like this? How do, we, how do we grow in our knowledge of Christ? First, becoming a Christian. So justification, sanctification, glorification. Three big words. We'll explain, explain them real simply, right? Justification is how you get right with God in his courtroom. We'll explain it in a minute. Sanctification is how you become more and more like the Lord Jesus. You grow as a Christian. Glorification is when you go to be with him and you're in his presence and you have no more sin. You're holy as he is holy. Justification, you get right with God. Sanctification, you're growing, becoming like God. Thirdly, you are uh, glorification is when you get to be in his presence. He's going to cover all three of these, 9, 10, and 11. Now I'm going to give you a sentence or a rap verse, depending on how you want to interpret it, uh, to help you learn what he teaches us here that that hopefully will help you remember it. So Paul teaches to know Christ means you've been justified through faith. You're longing to grow in grace until you see his face. All right? You've been justified by faith, longing to grow in grace until you see his faith. Look at verse 9 with me. Justified through faith. Verse, verse 9. So Paul says, being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, 
the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, earlier Paul said that as with righteousness, he was blameless. So before he was converted, he thought he was good before God. Now, when he looks back at who he was before God, he says, I, I literally, I was a mess. And I've got this righteousness freely given to me from another. Faith is not a good work that earns the righteousness, but faith is this instrument that receives this free gift of righteousness given by Christ. So how does a sinner stand before God the judge and live? Because he stands with the righteousness of Christ. The illustration that helps me best understand is I want you to imagine if you did something to me, the worst, one of the worst possible offenses you could ever do against me. Some of you guys have heard me do this in a sermon before or in membership class. But I want you to imagine that you murdered my wife and daughter. You killed them. And you come to the courtroom. They've got you locked up. And the problem in this deal is you were called on camera, three different angles, and about 15 different witnesses. So you're guilty, and it's obvious. And death is the sentence for your crime. You come in the courtroom, and they've got you locked up, and you've kind of got your head down. They tell you right before you go in the courtroom, hey, by the way, in this courtroom, there's no jury, only a judge. He'll hear your case. He's going to try you. He will sentence you. Whatever he says goes. So you come walking through the courtroom. You come up to the bench. You got your, your hands in cuffs. And you look up. And I'm the judge. And you realize, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. All these witnesses. We watch the scene. We watch the video. Watch the evidence. Hear the testimonies. And I look at you and I ask you, are you guilty? Killing my wife and daughter. You say, yes, I am. So you know the sentence for this crime is death. Yes, I do. And right before I sentence you, I look at the officers, I say, tell my son to come here. Nias comes walking in. In my illustration, he's like 33 and grown up. Not a little man. Nias comes walking in, and he stands between me and you. So now I can't see you anymore because I'm looking at my son. And my son, like Jesus in the garden, Father, is there any, way we can do, any other way we can do this? Not my will, but yours be done. Son, we agreed in eternity past. Now look at my son and say, Son, I sentence you to death for the murder of my wife and daughter. Take him away. They take him away. Crucify him. You're standing there looking at me. Head spinning. What just happened? I look at you. I say, I love you. My son, whom I love dearly, has now paid the penalty for your sin. So your sin has been paid for. I now want to declare you innocent of your sin because I declared him guilty of it. I'm not going to stop there. I want to give you his identity. I want to give you his righteousness. And I want to adopt you. I want you to come home with me be my child. Now the good news of the gospel is three days later when we're sitting at the table eating, Jesus comes, or Nias in the story, comes walking in the door. This is Justification. And what I want you to realize in the moment, so you see all this happen. And I look at you and I say, do you trust me? Do you trust that I've punished your sin? And do you trust that I'm good and merciful and also just? That I justly crushed your sin with death, but that I mercifully, graciously want to bring you in. Do you trust me? What do you say? Of course. I, what other kind of love would you ever find this anywhere? We'll say, return from your sin and trust me and come home with me. This is justification. This is what Paul says. Being found, having a righteousness, not my own. I stood before the judge guilty. He crushed his son in my place, but his son resurrected and he gave me his son's righteousness. This is why we celebrate on Easter, because justification can happen through repentance and faith. This is where we rest. This is justification. But then verse 11, he goes on. So again, justified by faith. So how do you know God? Well, first, you've got to repent of sin and trust Him. You've got to be justified by faith. Secondly, you've got to be, or in, once you're justified by faith, then you're longing to grow in grace. Look at verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. Justification, when you've been justified, when you've been saved, it leads to this longing to grow. You want to be more like Jesus. Now, you realize you don't have the power to do it, so you need His grace to do it, which is why I call it growth in grace. Like, Jesus, I need you more. Help me to grow. I want to know him. Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him as death. As Paul said earlier, Christians, those who worship by the Spirit, 
Romans 8, 11. Think about this Resurrection Sunday. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do you see the connection to Easter? Christ walked out of the grave. He sent the same spirit that raised him from the dead to dwell in you that you might grow. So how do you fight sin that you've been fighting your whole life? Because you have the very power that raised the Son of God from the dead dwelling in you. So Paul says, I just want to know him more in the power of his resurrection. That spirit power that raised him from the dead dwells in you so you can fight sin. You've been justified by grace through faith. Nothing you can do. Free righteousness given to you. But because that is true, now you are the power of the resurrection dwelling inside of you to fight sin and grow. And you've got nothing to lose. So you're not fighting sin hoping you don't get rejected. You've already been adopted and brought home. You're fighting as a child. You know God will never abandon you. So you're yearning to grow in grace. The Spirit gives us power to live for Christ's glory rather than for our own. He gives us power to joyfully suffer for Christ in the advancement of His kingdom. That's what we read earlier. It's what Paul said he was so excited about. Hey, I'm locked up, but don't worry about it. Gospel spreading, you guys are growing, no problem. Just worship, rejoice. You're safe, I'm good, whether in this life or in death. I don't care as long as Christ is glorified. I just want to know more. And then lastly, so again, that's sanctification. You're growing by grace, longing to be transformed more and more like Him. Justified by faith, longing to grow in grace until you see His face. Verse 11, that by any means possible, I may attain resurrection from the dead. Paul's humility is on display here. I was like, Christ, any means possible, I just want to be with you. So just like you walked out of the tomb, that's all I'm after. And for the Christian, if you're in Christ, the tomb won't be able to stop you either. Couldn't stop him, can't stop you. You will resurrect new glorified bodies. You'll dwell with Christ forever. Listen to how much Paul wanted to see Christ face in chapter 1, verse 21, 26. For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue for you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. He said, Christ, I, I really just want to die and be with you. But for the sake of your glory and the good of these people, I'll stay and tell them about you. So again, justified by faith, longing to grow in grace until you see his face. So we close just by asking, have you been justified by faith? Are you longing to grow in grace? Do you anticipate that great day when you get to see Christ face to face? No longer dimly as in a mirror, but actually face to face. Non-Christian, I ask you even now, has God awoken in you a desire to know him? Repent of your sin, trust in Christ's death on your behalf. What he did was enough for you. I don't care how sinful you are. You cannot out the grace of God. Repent and believe even today. Turn from your morality and rule keeping and trust in Christ's perfect life, sacrificial death on your behalf. Christian, is knowing Christ your one great ambition? Is that what you're after? So you work your job, you love your wife, you love your kids, all as a means of knowing Christ. Is this your one great ambition? If not, rest in Christ. This is interesting. If not, it's time to beat you up right now. If not, rest in Christ's finished work. So on the cross, right before he dies, what does he say? Greek word, to tell us die. What does it mean? It is finished. It's accomplished. Mission complete. So if you're in Christ, you have been justified by faith. You are growing in grace. Whether you want to stop it or not, he's going to make you grow. And you will see him face to face. And that is all finished and accomplished. Which is reason to worship and respond. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the good work of Christ on the cross. We thank you for forgiveness of sins. We turn away from being lazy and having ambitions that are so below the greatest ambition, which is to know you. You're so beautiful. You're holy. You're righteous. You're just, yet you're merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so we repent and find life in your name. So God, I pray for the Christian that their confidence would be in you. And that their primary one great ambition would be to know you. Not to use you to get something else, but to use you to get you. Christ, be freedom's one great ambition. 
God, for the non-Christian here, we just pray, God, they feel encouraged and loved and pursued by you first and foremost and by us secondly. They repent and find life in your name.